Well, good morning. I would like to welcome all of you here. So you are all well, very welcomed here in Armenia. I think in the normal circumstances, I would love to speak to you about the possibilities of working together with our relative countries, about projects that we can do together, developing education, new technologies, science, culture, tourism. But I do understand that today, these days are special. Well, special word uh, doesn't contain all of the emotions that we have, because it's uh, special, but it's also very hard. Hard for the nation, hard for the people. Especially it's hard for the people of Artsakh. I don't want to do a lengthy introduction. If you would just ask me a couple of questions, then I will understand what is that bothers you and what are the questions that you would like to hear an answer from the President of the Republic of Armenia. Do you really think the European Union is willing to afford an implication to stop this war? Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. President. Luca Steinmann, I'm an Italian journalist. I'm representing uh, Radio 24 Italy. And my question is related uh, about uh, Turkey. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you see a connection and a parallel between the aggressive attitude of Turkey towards uh, Armenia now and the, um, the behavior of Turkey towards France in the, in the last few weeks. Thank you. I'm a former member of parliament in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, I was a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and the OEC uh -huh. Parliamentary Assembly. Uh -huh. um, I was wondering, we've heard uh, reports that there, were, there was also shelling of Armenian territory. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the formal relation between Armenia and Azerbaijan in terms of war? And what does it mean in terms of the responsibility of the Russian Federation in helping you in case Armenian okay. territory is attacked? Thank you. Good morning. I'm, I'm Gabriela Sanchez. I'm a journalist of uh, Spanish digital media, El Diario.es. The situation of the front line is really difficult. The Armenian army and, uh, and the army of Artsakh uh, is, uh, have, has less capacity of the Azeri army and Turkish army. Uh, how what, what is your expectation about this war? How do you think it's possible to stop it uh, with these conditions in, in Artsakh? Well, thank you very much for the questions. I'll try to answer all of them. Obviously, this war is, was, somehow was expected because the last many years, uh, several years, um, Azerbaijan and Turkey were getting closer and closer and closer, both politically and militarily. I do believe that by getting so much closer to Turkey, Azerbaijan is losing a part of its, uh, its sovereignty. And there's more and more facts that you, you see that uh, decisions in Baku are made with the advice, but uh, strong advice of, of Turkey. Now about, now about the war. This is the second big war that is happening. There were small clashes, three-day war, four-day war, during these 26 years of, of, the, of the ceasefire that we had. But the first war was, was for several years. And uh, the, the moment this war started, the first war started, if you remember, it started with the decision of the representatives of Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region in in Azerbaijan, a decision claiming that, okay, we have been a part of Azerbaijan for 70 years, and we don't want, no longer we want to be a part of this. And I think you would, would say, why? Because before, Nagorno-Karabakh -Karabakh was never a part of, of Azerbaijan. First of all, if you go, go back a couple of hundred years, there was no Azerbaijan as a state at all. Secondly, even if you take the first independent state of, of, of Azerbaijan, which started in 1918, Nagorno-Karabakh was not a part of that. So Karabakh was given to 
Azerbaijan by the then the Soviet leadership. And because the national issues were run by Yosef Stalin, so he was the one that was the mastermind of that. He had his probably reasons of doing that. For 70 years, Azerbaijan had a chance, had a chance to prove that Armenians and Azeris together can live in harmony in, inside Azerbaijan Republic, be that Soviet Republic or any republic. But what was happening was the other way around. I mean, it was, even under Soviet control, they were trying to ethnically cleanse Nagorno-Karabakh, closing Armenian schools. They were not, they were not developing any industry in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. People didn't have future there, so a lot of them left. In 1920, the population of Nagorno-Karabakh was 350,000. This is on record, okay? Out of which 95% were Armenians. Around 3% then in the record says it is the Caucasian Tatars, which are the Azeris, and there were Greeks, there were Russians, and others. 1920, 350,000. At the end of 1989, 80, 1990, the population was 160, 150,000. So where were the 200,000 they left? So the 70 years under Azari rule, it was proven that Azaris, they don't want Armenians to be there, just want them out, even under Soviet rule. So that's why Armenians voted, even as a part of Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region, their representatives overwhelmingly voted I mean, it's, it was 99.98% of voters voted for independence from. And this was just before the collapse of Soviet Union. So according to Soviet rules, that nation had the right of doing that. So by constitution of Soviet Union, the people of Nagorno-Karabakh had the right of claiming independence, and they did. And what was the response? The response was the killings of Armenians in Baku, Sumgayit, Bagara, and uh, many places. And the creation of another more than a million of Armenian refugees from Azerbaijan. That's a fact. So the offer was a very civilized one. So we are here, like many nations in this world, including the Scots, that have the right of deciding their future in a referendum. We had a referendum. We voted to, to be independent. But unlike UK, the response from Azerbaijan was killing and starting a war. And this is where the first war started. And that war took several years, as you know. And it was eventually, we had the ceasefire in 1994, May 12th. But this was several years. And those years, early years, I was Armenia's uh, first ambassador abroad. Then I was Armenia's ambassador to NATO and to European Union as well. And all of my colleagues were saying, this is, this War for Armenians is for nothing because you're going to lose it. Your Karabakh is very small. Armenia, even proper Armenia, doesn't have the resources. Azerbaijan is three, four times bigger. They have more weapons. They have Turkey as a friend. And for, at the beginning of the war, Azerbaijan was succeeding in the war. But then somehow, starting from end of 92, 93, it went the other way around. So Armenians won the war. And the Azeri side was forced to sign a ceasefire in 1994. And the outcome of the ceasefire was what you know, the Karabakh and the other territories. And that ceasefire was signed in Bishkek. But the important thing is that the ceasefire and, and Bishkek documents were signed by three parties, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Karabakh. So Azerbaijan signed a document where they recognize that Nagorno-Karabakh is a side of the conflict, i.e. recognizing them as legal entity, state or whatever you would like to call it. So that document was signed by three. And then, as you know, the Minsk Group was created uh, by OSC. And there were very successful negotiations, difficult negotiations. They are never easy. But successful in a sense for during the years, a lot of issues were debated, discussed. There was somehow a trust 
well, a strange trust, but a trust because people used to come together, presidents, foreign ministers. So everything was going in a direction that, that there are a couple of issues that need a compromise and political will, strong political will to finalize the deal. But instead of that, what we got is the war. Okay. And why I'm telling this, of course it's difficult. It's, and as Azerbaijan is already claiming victory and saying that we are getting closer to the end and they are fight until the end. So the question is, what's the end? Well, in Azeri, probably vision, the end is complete cleansing of Armenians, forcing them completely out from their historic land that they live for th thousands of years. But there is no end there. We have learned from history that even if you win a war temporarily, there is no final defeat and there is no final uh, victory because uh, the history continues. And uh, the most connected example of that is the ethnic cleansing of Armenians in historic uh, Western Armenia in Anatolia. I mean ethnic cleansing combined with killings of one and a half million of people with the aim of destroying a nation and sending Armenians to the deserts of Syria and eventually those who survived created the Armenian diaspora. Did that war against humanity finish? No. It's 105 years. There are several generations that have replaced those who were the survivors of genocide. There are their children, their grandchildren, their children of their grandchildren. 105 years, fourth fifth generation of people. And they continue, we continue fighting, not with a gun, but fighting for justice. For re and this time, the first step is the recognition of genocide. Many countries have recognized the genocide. France has recognized, Russia has recognized the genocide. German parliament has recognized the genocide. American Senate has recognized genocide and so on and so forth. So the fight continues. And this is a generation of people that have never been you know, on that historic lands of their ancestors. Some of them even don't speak Armenian, but it doesn't matter. So there's no fighting until the end. The end of the world? No. There is no end. And there will be no end, no victory for Azerbaijan and doesn't matter how much land now they will conquer or get, and doesn't matter how much ethnic cleansing and destruction. Well, I heard the, the day before they're claiming that have occupied now or taken over several villages and sites. So, well, I thought that this list, first of all, is not, was not accurate about the numbers. Secondly, it was not complete. Because when you claim that you have taken over several villages, you have to add to that list how many schools you have destroyed. Because they are destroying the schools. How many hospitals you have destroyed. How many nurseries. They have bombed a, a clinic where children are born in Stepanakert. Built by one of our Armenian friends uh, from Russia. So why don't you give the whole list? How much unhuman things you have done by destroying? How, my, how many lives you have destroyed? Elderly children, young boys who are fighting, losing their lives. So that list is not, is not final. And I think the day will come when we, will, we have to finalize that list as well, to speak about the war crimes. I would say that I will support UN High Commission or different High Commission's efforts to look at this second war in Nagorno-Karabakh very, very carefully. Armenians didn't start this war. Armenians didn't start shelling the, the civilian uh, entities like villages or cities. The first day of the war, they started shelling. 
And you don't need a proof. It's simple logic. There was no reason for Armenians starting a war. And how do you combine this? Building a school and nursery, a road, a church, and starting a war. There's no logic there. It's obvious that Azerbaijan has started the war together with Turkey. Now it comes to the role of other international organizations, and I was asked by you about, about the role of European Union here. Well, I was recently in Brussels and I met with the President of European Commission and with the Vice President. But long and quite open discussions. Obviously, I cannot tell you the details of that. But you could have probably seen from the reports that were coming out from our meetings. First of all, this meeting was quite open and honest. Secondly, we, of course, were discussing what is that Europe can do. At this moment, if there's anything that Europe can do is to put pressure on, first of all, Turkey. Because the conflict has gone far from the original one where there was a conflict uh, by Republic of Artsakh and Azerbaijan and the people of Artsakh and the government of Azerbaijan. Now it's a complete, because there's a third player, Turkey, openly using their own presence, their offices, their advisors, and bringing to the, to the conflict also terrorists. Terrorists from Syria that were used and raised trained by, by Turkey, used in Libya, in Iraq, Libya, and then now they are in Caucasus here. And I don't think that anybody needs proofs because this is proven fact. So what is European Union can do today? Because they still continue talking to Turkey. Turkey is an important uh, partner for European Union. It's an important trade partner. As you said, there are a lot of people of Turkish origin living in Germany or in Belgium, in many European countries. There are two things that we have to distinguish from each other. One thing is the government of Turkey. One thing is the leadership of Turkey. And the other thing is the people of Turkey. And I can bring you an example. I take you back to the year 2007. I've been in Turkey many times and chairing the big international conferences on energy, on the region, giving lectures at different universities, mostly at Koch University. So I know Turkey. I'm taking you back to the year 2007 when this government of Turkey was not so strong and Turkey was a different country. In the year 2007, there was a famous Armenian political figure, a journalist whose name was Haran Dink, and he was shot in front of his, uh, his, his magazines, journals, uh, editorial building where, the, where they have their edit. And I do the remember very well hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Turks coming out to the street on his funeral day. And they were claiming that they are Hrant Dink. So let's not mix people of Turkey or big part of Turkey that are not nationalized or because they are intellectuals, there are people have, have, have high human values. There are a lot of Turks that are claiming and, and openly speaking that the Turkish government has to recognize the genocide. But there are people that killed Randing. There were hundreds of thousands that came to his funeral. So I am speaking about the current Turkish government and their policies. Now, Turkey. Turkey and, and France. Turkey and Italy. And Turkey, the, the, what's happening? I think you have to look at the Turkish president's huge ambitions to become and to be recognized as very important, another superpower in this world, or at least in the bigger region, which is Europe and so. And you, when you look at the policies, what are happening today, Turkish government and president with his ambitions is creating points of instability all around Turkey, breaking all possible status quo. By creating instabilities, the moment you create instability, because you are the creator, you are the solution as well. So you become important. 
They tried to create an instability in Egypt, didn't work. Now they are in Libya, they are in Iraq, they were in Syria, okay? Eastern Mediterranean, Greece, Cyprus. Now trying to also, they are now in the north of Lebanon and God help Lebanon. And now Caucasus. So all around 360 degree instability created by Turkey. And what's the solution? Turkey. So Turkey becomes important. Turkey becomes important. So international community, European Union, UN, everybody has to basically speak to Turkey with more respect. So that negative attitude and destruction is a way of gaining respect. Turkey is a member of NATO. I was in Brussels and asked the Secretary General, both openly and during our close discussions, how on earth a member of NATO can come to a region like Artsakh, start using NATO weapons, trained people by NATO, because Turkish operators of the drones, weapons which are NATO weapons. If and even if you take the drones that are, the Turkish is producing, Bayraktar, DB2, if you look at that, only the body is Turkish. The remaining is the engine is from Austria. The avionic part parts are from Canada. A big part of their missile guidance systems are from Britain and so on. It's a Europe and from Germany as well. It's a European NATO weapon used against civilians in Nagorno-Karabakh. And how on earth? When Turkey signed for membership to NATO, did it sign under the paper saying that he is free, Turkey is free to do, use weapons, technology, know-how, officers of, that are a part of NATO against third party that doesn't have anything to do with, with, uh, with NATO? Of course not. And that's a question that should be asked. And that's a question that should be asked to European Union as well. You are still hoping to negotiate with Turkey possible partnership and also membership. Well, Turkey doesn't share with you your values. And one of the first values that the European Union has is tolerance. And where is the Turkish tolerance? Here. I mean, uh, Turkish, I mean the Turkish government. Tolerance. Where is it? Tolerance to other people. Tolerance to all other people's rights. Tolerance to other people's religion, tolerance to other people's culture, history, none. And how on earth Europe can have? I do understand. Turkey is economic partner. I do understand. The several years this was a build up to basically make somehow Europe also a hostage of Turkey. And when you look why Turkey is in, is in Azerbaijan, you'll get the answer to that. I mean, Turkey was claiming, Turkey was claiming that they went because they have ethnic brothers. It's 21st century. Who goes into war for ethnic brothers? Imagine Russians starting going into war with their ethnic Slavic partners if somebody has a problem. And where are the ethnic brothers of Turkey? They don't end up in Azerbaijan because they came from Central Asia, Central Asia up to Mongolia, north of uh, China, Russia. So many ethnic brothers in Russia. So where do you end it? Of course, it was 30, 40 years ago. I would think that we would thought this is a sort of an anachronism, an old dinosaur that will never fly. But this is 21st century. This is a world that is no longer a single polar politically. It's not even double polar. It's not a triple polar. It's a world that is unpredictable, unstable. And in this world, even this sort of a crazy idea can be dangerous. Because the way Mr. Erdogan sees it is that, okay, there will be a, an army or political connection of Turkic nations, and I will rule it. Like he wants to be also representing Islam. 
Well, I don't believe in that one because a big part of Islamic world was under Ottoman Empire and they do remember they were not happy members of that Ottoman Empire. There were members, like Armenians were a part of Ottoman Empire. You go to Istanbul, I mean, you go to famous two or three palaces were made by, uh, built by Armenians. They were members of parliament. They were philosophers, poets, businessmen. What happened to them? They were slaughtered in one day. I mean, this is a key factor. The second thing they claimed that there were uh, PKK fighters in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, complete nonsense. You find one guy, half a guy, show it to me. Third, they were there to protect the international energy logistics, the pipelines. Again, where is the logic? If Armenians wanted to shoot and destroy these pipelines, they should have done that 20 years ago when this pipeline was in construction. Not today. By shooting these pipelines 20 years ago, Armenians would say, you cannot build this pipeline, dear friends, without me. Either I have to be a partner or we have to resolve Nagorno-Karabakh before you build that. But Armenians didn't. That's the nature of Armenians. They didn't. Probably if it was Armenian presidents of the time where, like Mr. Erdogan, they would have probably bombed it 20 years ago. Well, Armenians didn't bomb the pipelines. Azerbaijan made billions, and that billions were used to buy weapons, and that weapons are, are killing Armenians now. And where is the international community? And where is Europe, European Union, that is benefiting from that oil and gas? Question. So, Turkey is not there to protect it from Armenians. Turkey is there to stay in Azerbaijan. I think there's one clear result of this war. Turkey is in Azerbaijan and it will stay in Azerbaijan. And it will control the pipelines. And it will control the energy going through Trans-Anatolian and Trans-Adriatic to the south of Europe, which includes Italy and other South European countries. So Europe will be a hostage of Turkey. So one card very well played. Central Asia will be a hostage as well because they have to sell their oil and gas, Caspian states. It's not only Azeri oil and gas there. Now, the second card that Turkey is playing is the refugees. Four million refugees on the borders of European Union. And European Union pays six billion euros to keep them. But it's a card. If you don't behave Europe, I'll release, relieve them to come to Europe and then see, let's see what would happen to Europe. 3.7 million of these refugees, or 4 million, are from Syria. Turkish role in destruction of Syria is obvious. So you destruct the state, create the refugees, then you use the area refugees against Europe. So that's another card. And the third card, of course, is the terrorists. They are training a lot of terrorist groups, in, uh, especially in Syria, are connected with Turkey, financed by Turkey, and used by Turkey. And you don't need four million of them here. You need just a couple of hundred of them. So, if you see what the Turkish ambition is, to be recognized as a superpower of the region, and to bully Europe, and to make everybody, and basically using the situation that there is no leadership in the world. Americans are busy. China is too far. Russia is busy as well. But we need to stop this war. Because this is now not only a war for heritage, for culture, for survival, for the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. People in Nagorno-Karabakh are fighting for security of Europe as well somehow. And my appeal to all of you is to put, first of all, to try to explain this to your colleagues in your respective countries and explain to them that this is not good at all. If we don't stop Turkish ambitions now there in Azerbaijan, if Azerbaijan will be taken over by Turkey, then I think we will have a situation where that Europe will also suffer. For Europe, it looks very far. So, well, 
I mean, it's, where is Karabakh? Oh my God, show it me on the, on, on the map. Where is it? But the reality is, the world is changing. And this world is going to be more and more unpredictable, unstable. I call it quantum. Even have a theory on that. But for you, it's very simple. It's going to be unpredictable. And there will be no international strong rules, conditions, enforcements to stop ambitions, ill ambitions, like the one that Turkey has today. Turkey is using, I mean, the benefit of their economic growth that they had the last several years. But the people who were the designers of this economic growth are no longer in the government. They were members of the same party, but they're out. So economic growth, now economically grows, grows down, so what do you do? What do you do? You pump nationalism, extremism. So your economy goes down, but maybe your popularity goes up internally. Shelling of Armenia. Yeah. Well, there's no permanent shelling or permanent attack. And if you take incidents out there, but if you take incidents, they can be interpreted as incidents, not as a systematic thing. Because then systema if it's systematic that it's sort of a claiming war against Armenia, and then it will, it will put in action international uh, agreements that Armenia has with uh, other states, including Russian Federation. But shelling once or twice, three, three times, four times, there are Turkish and Israeli drones that were shot and they're on, uh, on, in Iran, on, in their Iranian territory. That doesn't mean there is a war against Iran. So it's a very sensitive moment today. And it's a very sensitive moment in the sense that it's sort of a, this one is sort of crossroad. Where does it go from here? We'll go into longer war between Artsakh and, and Azerbaijan. That should have been or could have been the case if there was no Turkey. Although I think if there was no Turkish factor, Azerbaijan and Artsakh and Armenians would have agreed on a ceasefire. There is no ceasefire, and every and each time, the ceasefire was broken, not by Armenian side. I'm telling you not because I'm the Armenian president, because it's logic, because Armenians want the ceasefire. Armenians want to go back to the negotiating table, because many Armenians believe that's the way, and that me as the President of the Republic, I, I do believe that there is no final military solution. It can't be there. You'll get something else. And especially in this new world, it's not necessarily the physical world on the ground, you'll get something else. But one thing is for sure, we will never forget, and people of Karabakh will never forget. And that will, Confrontation will continue, like the Armenians have never forgotten the genocide. Even after 105 years, even after changes of generation, fourth and fifth. Of course, I have to emphasize here that Russia has a very important role here. First of all, uh, it has good relations both with Armenia and Azerbaijan. It has also good relations and big trade relations with Turkey. And, and Russia has historic relations to Armenia. And I think Russia's role as a mediator, not only as a member of the, as a co-chair of the Minsk Group, but as a mediator of ceasefire is important here. Unfortunately, the Israeli government continues supplying Azerbaijan with weapons. Even if you have a signed contract, there is a war. Morally, you have to stop during the war supplying it. But that's morality. Okay? Especially for a country that has seen a Holocaust. I was at the 75th anniversary of Holocaust there. And I raised the question of recognition by Israel, the Armenian genocide. Okay. 
So we will continue working with everybody. Very close neighbor with whom we have excellent relations is Iran. And despite the fact they have their own problems with European Union, bigger problems with the United States, I think they are an important neighbor, friendly nation to Armenia, and we, we should continue working with them. And of course with the states of the Gulf as well. Because not everybody in the Islamic world is happy with what Turkey is doing in Azerbaijan. Mr. President, during these days, what does give you personally hope? You know, I, I would not say that I'm living with the hope. I think when you speak about hope, it, it sounds as if you don't uh, have, you don't know what you are doing, you just have a hope. I'm sorry, I work hard every day, know what I am doing, and I am sure that eventually Artsakh will win, because victory in our case means defending your home, your values, your religion, your heritage. And I'm not hoping that something will happen, because I know the solution. Like 30 years ago during the first war, we didn't have this, we didn't have that. Our colleagues, diplomats in NATO were telling Mr. Ambassador, uh, well, Armenia should stop, Armenians in Artsakh should stop fighting because they are losing the war. They will lose the war. Azerbaijan is so big, they also have the support of Turkey. But in 1994, the same people were telling me, Armenia has the most powerful army in Caucasus. So I'm not, I'm not hoping. I'm working hard for that victory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but just Mr. President. No, I live in Netherlands. And my question is about the Armenian diaspora which is uh, very, very powerful outside of Armenia. It's around 8 million people living outside. So um, I see how many efforts and arrangements is being done by the Armenian diaspora all over the world, including financial donations, demonstrations, raises awareness of the Armenian story nowadays. What else can be done by the Armenian diaspora these days and what kind of guidance you can give to us when we come back? to our respective countries. Thank you so much. Well, that's the strength of Armenia. It's people. It's the same, the same story when years ago they were asking me the same question. They are asking me today, what was there in the early 90s that brought Armenians to victory? What is that they had? They didn't have weapons, Mark. They didn't have energy. They didn't have big numbers. What is they had? My answer to that is that we had each other. We had each other, and that's the most powerful thing that you can have. Is the human, human value. It's always the case. You can have the biggest army, the biggest money, but if you don't have the people that believe in something together, you will never win. So we had each other 30 years ago, and we have each other today. Armenians in Artsakh, Armenians here, and Armenians living in diaspora. I will take this opportunity to thank everybody who is working hard to support Armenia, Artsakh today in diaspora. I will remind everybody that if they want to make the financial donations to Republic of Armenia and Artsakh for construction, not for the war, is the Armenia Fund, that, and I'm the chairman of that fund. But I will also like to say honestly to you that I know that the potential of that diaspora is an order bigger than what we are doing now. So what we need is an organization. What we need is a discipline, a devotion, because all the other ingredients are there. And I hope that winning this war and protecting our homeland and not allowing another genocide to happen, we will understand finally the strength of diaspora that is there 
together with the friends of Armenia uh, and Armenian friends of Armenians. It's not only the diaspora. I personally have lived 30 years outside Armenia. I'm sort of a Armenian and from diaspora. So I'm, I'm with you and I'm here. But one thing is clear in my life. I have so many friends that are non-Armenian that are as passionate as what's happening today as Armenians, even more. So the strength is because we have each other. The strength is that we have, because we have also the, the support of real friends who are not Armenian, but share with us human values. And I think we should be better organized. Thank you very much indeed. I wish everybody, first of all, health, because Armenia is, is fighting two wars, one against COVID, and we lose everyday people. And this is the cruelty of Azerbaijan starting a war when their own nation was fighting a war against COVID, and we are fighting. We are losing a big number of people every day in COVID. So we are fighting two wars. I wish everybody, your nations, to fight your war against COVID successfully. I wish everybody health. And I'm going to th ask you to help us to win the second war. And in our case, winning a war is not aggression. It's not conquering other people's land. It's protecting your home. Help us to protect our history, our culture, our religion, our heritage. And I wish you everybody health. Thank you very much for coming.